Gamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritam Gamaya Habir Habir Maeti Rudrayate Dakshinamukam Te Namam Pahinityam Te Namam Pahinityam Om Shanti 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 Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from death to mortality. O oh Lord, let us through and through and ever protect us with thy loving presence. Om, peace, peace, peace to all beings everywhere. <clears throat> Welcome everyone here to our Tribuka Monastery. I'm Swami Hari Namanata, as Swamiji introduced me. It's been about, I think, three years since I've been here. It's been a long time because of COVID and then in, uh, going to Harvard. So I feel like this is, this is the place where I actually joined back in, in 97. So this is feeling of my, my own home. So um, today, I'd like to talk to you about my experiences and lessons that I learned at Harvard. Now you may ask, why is a monk going to Harvard University? Well, <clears throat> so one morning, I was given a call by our General Secretary Swami. He's the sort of commander in chief of our of our Ramakrishna order. He's in India. Gave me a call one morning. Said we'd like you to apply for this program that's at Harvard University. It's fully funded, uh, a monastic scholarship to go to Harvard. So I applied, but there are the monastics applying, so I didn't know if I was going to get in or not. Thank you, Swami. So, so um, <clears throat> I got in, and um, basically it was an experience where. They wanted monastics from different traditions to come in to experience life at a university and to dwell in classes that we normally wouldn't have a chance, like chaplaincy, counseling, and other various traditions. So I had this opportunity, and I went last year. And it was quite an experience, so I'd like to take you on this journey with me. And maybe you'll also see some of the lessons that I learned in this experience. So next, <clears throat> the journey began back in uh, September of last year, where there were two monks from the Hindu tradition. Um, it was created by Dr. Uh, Clooney, Francis Clooney, who wanted to have this opportunity for Hindu monks to come into Harvard. So he, he opened up this program, and it was, there was a, um, a couple who gave money for this program so we could go. And so I'm the monastic from the Ramakrishna order, and there's two of us, and then you'll see uh, there's a Salika Vandan, he's from the Swami Narayan order. So both of us had gone. And there are also monks from other traditions, like a Buddhist monk here, go to the next, next. And so there were, uh, we had monks from various traditions, few of us, less than 10 overall, coming to this program. Next. What happens is, to take you on this journey, we have to fly to where Harvard is located. It's located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So when the first thing you get off the plane and you enter to Massachusetts, you're gonna see these turkeys roaming around all over Cambridge. They're the original inhabitants of Cambridge. So wherever they go, we stop. Sort of like if you've ever been to India, wherever the cow goes, traffic stops. The same thing with the turkeys. They're, they're honored with that same respect. Cambridge is considered one of the intellectual hubs of America. Next. And as you're walking around Cambridge, it's got a lot of history. You're going to walk by and see houses owned by Robert Frost, E.E. E. Cummings, and even Julia Childs, who you may know is a famous TV personality who brought French cuisine into American culture. So you get a sense of 
what history it's like in Cambridge. Next, it's also a place where Swami Vivekananda came, uh, the founder of our order. And he actually was invited by Professor John Wright, who was a professor at Harvard, to speak at Harvard University. And on your left-hand side, you'll see uh, Saber Hall, where he spoke. And he spoke about religions, religious, religious life in India in 1894. He stayed at Professor Wright's place in Cambridge. He even went to, was invited to go see a play. The play was about Roman indulgence in Latin. So it was things that you'd see Swamiji would come into things where he'd have to adapt to certain situations, but he'd always learn from each situation. <laughs> Next. When you enter the campus itself, what you'll see is you'll see this image in front of you here. It's the most photographed image in Harvard. And it's a statue. And when you look below the statue into the cement, you'll see in, in great in that cement are three things. See, John Harvard, founder, and 1638. These are known as the three great lies. Why are they lies? First of all, the statue you see in front of you is not of John Harvard. Oh, no. Nobody knew who John Harvard, what he looked like. So the image you see is actually, most likely, the image of the sculptor's son. The second lie is that John Harvard is not the founder. Harvard University was founded by Massachusetts General Court. But John Harvard, it was named, the university was named after John Harvard because he had given his entire library collection to the university. And that time, at that time, books were very expensive. Also, he gave half his estate. That's why it was named after Har John Harvard. The third lie is that it was not founded in 1638. It was founded in 1636. So these are the three great lies. And on the side of the sculpture in the cement, on the side you'll notice there is a symbol there. That is the Harvard emblem. Let's, next. When you take a closer look at the emblem, you'll see what it, what it is it picked. Well, it shows that if you look at the top, let's look at the right image there, there are three books. The two top books are facing you. The bottom book is facing away. The book on the left-hand side represents the Old Testament. The book on the right hand, top right-hand side represents the New Testament. And the book at the bottom represents yet to be written. It's actually facing, its cover is facing you. The other ones, the pages are open. And, and, it's, um, and it's yet to be written because it's waiting for the second coming of Christ. So can, we, can you go back to the original slide? Before that, I can just, yeah, perfect. So, what you see here then is that, oh, I forgot to tell you, and did you see, just go back one, sorry. You'll see the words veritas, veritas, written on. What does veritas mean? Anybody? Truth. truth. Right. Now go back. So, what you see here is that truth is embedded in the foundation of this structure, and what's happening? And what you see is this, it's embedded in this structure, it's covered in these three lies, right? And what happens, if you look at the image, a so-called Mr. Harvard here, it's, he's looking out. Where is he looking out at? He's looking out at the science buildings, the social studies buildings, and the art building. So this is really interesting, because from a Vedantic interpretation, follow me closely here, very dis in our interpretation, would be the truth, the transcendental truth, Brahman, covered in what? Covered in these three lies we call Maya, or the three gunas. And how does it reveal itself to us? As this beautiful, mysterious world, revealed as the science, as the empirical sciences, uh, empirical truths of science, the goodness of humanity, and the beauty of the arts. That's what you see all around you at the campus. So 
by following sciences back to truth, by following the goodness of humanity back to its source, by following the beauty of art back to its source, you get to the original truth, veritas, that transcendental truth, which we call Brahman. And do you know why Harvard was founded? It was founded because the original purpose was for to train ministers to preach the word of God and reveal this truth. So it's really amazing. Next, the next, one more. And in short, I don't want to go into this, but it's seen as Brahman is a transcendental tooth called Sajitanada, and it's seen through the veil of ignorance or Maya, or the three gunas. It's expressed as tr truth, beauty, and goodness. And that is reflected in the world as science, the humanities, and the arts. It's really a beautiful way to think about this university and its as what the actual purpose and intent is for. Next. Now, when we go from this image, I want to take you to the Harvard Divinity School, which is at one end of the campus. As we walk by, you're going to pass by the Science Bid Center, the Science Building. And you're going to see that this building actually looks like an object. Can anybody just, I know this is a wild guess, but can you think what kind of object this looks like? No? The dome? Uh, like, a, like a dome dome? Um, it looks like stairs. Yeah, that's close. It actually looks like a certain type of camera. Right? This was founded, this, the money given to this, um, for this building was next, was by Mr. Edwin Land. And he invented the Polaroid camera. How many have ever had a Polaroid camera? Now, you remember if you had a Polaroid, remember the flash that you put on top of the camera? So that's kind of like the uppermost part of that, uh, uh, that building there. And so it's a tribute by the architects to Mr. Edwin Land, uh, thanking him for his money. So next. Now what happens is we get to the Harvard Divinity School itself. So uh, you see on the left-hand side is the building itself. And then there's added extensions or wings on the right-hand side. When I came to Harvard, nobody had been physically on campus for two years because of COVID. So when I came, we all, everybody was new. Even if you had been there, the Divinity School is a three-year program. So some people were seniors and never had touched the campus. So when we got there, what did we see? Well, the people that come to Harvard next are coming for three essential purposes. One is to get trained in ministry. The second is to go on to higher academia, or graduate studies. And the third is to basically work in nonprofit sector as social activist. So you'll see that there are 357 students the time I went, coming from 46 different religious traditions. So you have a rainbow of different opinions and, sp and perspectives on various types of issues. And I'll give you an example of what this means. We had a Jewish Ukrainian student from Ukraine who had come. And she talked about the atrocities of what the Ukrainians were facing at that time. And what happened, the devastation that was happening to her community. And when you're talking to her, you're getting the sense that, oh, you really feel antagonistic to these Russian soldiers. We had another student, she was Buddhist, she came from Siberia, which is part of Russia. And she talked about how Putin had recruited from her, from her village, half the men were being forced to go and fight in Ukraine. And they were being killed, slaughtered. And she said the result was that the indigenous culture which she belonged to the spirituality, the culture, the customs was being lost because half the men was being wiped away. So you kind of start to get perspective of it's, it's, any issue is not black and white. There's many different ways of looking at things. Another example, just want to find like what type of student comes here. 
every, every one of these students has their own history. I'm just going to bring one of the students. He happened to be a good friend of mine. He's in a couple of my classes. His name was Jeff. He worked at Amazon. He told me I can use his story. He was a software engineer working at Amazon for many years. He had this reoccurring dream that by the time he turned 75, he would feel like life had just was, there was an emptiness to life. He'd feel like it became meaningless. And he didn't want to wake up like that. So he started meditating, and he had this profound vision of Neem Karoli Baba. Does, do you guys know who he is? He's an Indian saint. And in that vision, a voice awakened within him. He used to call that, that's his GPS, his God-pointing system that awakened within him. The voice told him to go to Neem Karoli Baba's ashram in New Mexico, and he served there for three years. And then eventually, he went to Harvard Divinity School, where I met him, and he wants to be a Hindu chaplain to serve the community that way. So each one of these students has a different story where they're coming from. And they're really, everyone's very knowledgeable. Next. One of the things that came up in Harvard was you get exposed to a lot of different experiences. And sometimes you'd be challenged by these experiences. <clears throat> When you get there, you start to get in these round, you get in these groups, round, and you form these round, round table groups. You begin to introduce yourself with certain labels. You talk about the pronouns that you want to be introduced by. Like I'd be a he, his, uh, him. There are she, her, hers. And also they, them, theirs. What happened for me, because I wasn't used to this, I kept making mistakes. I'd see a person who looked physically masculine to me, and I referred to him as he, and they kept saying, no, I prefer to be referred to as they. So after enough mistakes, somebody just pulled me aside and wanted to explain the, what was happening here. So they told me the pronouns, the labels we use, are like identities. They're like a name that we're acknowledged by, honored for who we are. And although people may biologically look one way, but internally feel a different way, meaning the biological sex does may not match their internal gender, because that's the way the software of the soul works, still we all want to be seen, heard, and respected. And when you start thinking about this from a Vedantic way, you start to see that it's the divine expressing itself in every individual embodiment. It's the divine expressing itself in every individual package with its uniqueness. So why can't we honor the divine in every soul and celebrate its unique, its unique expression? That's what namaste means. Namaste means I salute the divine in you. So from a Vedantic standpoint, we'll think, well, labels don't matter. You know, I'm the Atman. I'm beyond labels. So it shouldn't matter, right? I would say answer is yes and no. Spiritual life is a journey. And the journey goes from our confused sense of self to what is our identity? Am I Indian or American? What's my role in life? What's my purpose? What's my meaning? to knowing our authentic self. And our authentic self is what we feel we are. We're true to our inner nature. We're true, we become aligned to the inner dispositions within us. And when we're aligned to our own samskaras, our inner disposition, then our talents start to manifest. We start to flourish, we have confidence, and we can give into this world. We can play, we have meaning and purpose. And then, ultimately, there may come a time where you feel that I no longer want to be bound by these labels. The labels at this point empower me. They, they give me a sense of purpose. But then there may come a time where, you know what? I don't feel like I'm Indian or American. I'm a universal citizen. I am the light of the infinite consciousness. I am the Atman. At these points, Labels no longer are applied to you. They bind you 
and you want to move beyond them, that's when you go from your transcendent self. So you can think of it maybe as a three-step process. The confused self, going to your authentic self, to a transcendent self. There is a, next, there is a god in the Hindu uh, culture called Ardha Naishwara. Ardha means half. Nari means uh, woman. Ishwara means man. You have half, half the divine masculine and feminine within you. In spirituality, could it be that we're supposed to balance our masculinity and femininity and then rise beyond that to our transcendent self? Next. So after you're done, after you're done introducing yourself, you're going to go into the main room and have an orientation by the Dean of Harvard Divinity School, Dr. Dean Hampton. He's a wonderful soul. He's going to come in and he's going to give you a roadmap to what your future may be like. And the metaphor he uses is the metaphor of a car. And what he talked about was when you look at your rear view mirror, you're going to ask yourself, where are you coming from? What are the things, the backgrounds, the, uh, what, I'm sorry, where are you coming from emotionally, psychologically, and intellectually? What has your past been like? He talked about that as a society, we had just gone through the COVID global pandemic, racial injustice, the polarization of American politics, global warming, and the unease about America's role in the global community. When you look at your side view mirror, what do you see? That's where he said indicates your blind spots. What are the assumptions or your background, your privileges that you hold on to that may cause you to see, not to see things that are right in front of you? As for Harvard, he talked about, it's about the slavery, how we participate in slavery, and the way we treat indigenous people, and how now we have to reconcile for this. Then he said, when you look ahead, what does your future entail? What does the road to the futures for you entail? He said that research has shown, if you want to have a satisfactory life, and life of fulfillment, there are a few things you have to do. One is to cultivate gratitude. Two, perform acts of kindness, kindness randomly. Three, celebrate and savor the small things of life. Four, and find meaning and purpose in the mundane things you do, in your routines. When you do this, you'll get, create a sense of belonging. When you do this, you'll get a sense of connection to the people around you, to your environment, and also you want to connect to that ultimate reality because life is just passing you by, but you want to get a sense of, this is where I belong, and this will give you a sense of happiness and fulfillment. So after his lecture, I start thinking to myself, what am I, if I look at my rearview mirror, what am I coming in with? to Harvard. He said that I'm coming in with a Vedantic lens, a, a way of seeing. And what does that create within me? Is there a feeling of superiority or inferiority? Am I coming in with the knowledge that I'm a male, monastic from the Ramakrishna order, an Indian American? And how does that shape the way and color the lens I'm viewing through? Then if I look at my side view mirror, well, what are my blind spots? And how am I going to know when I hit my blind spots? And then finally, when I look forward, how am I going to integrate all the knowledge that I learn into one bigger cohesive picture? What does my future hold for me after leaving Harvard? These are some of the thoughts that started going on. Now, in this um, next... When you go to Harvard, you're going to enter some of the classes. 
And I'm going to sort of group the classes that I had into three main groups. You'll see the scripture classes would tend to be academic. They're head heavy. There are um, practical classes, which are more like counseling, um, chaplaincy courses, which are more heart heavy, feeling oriented. And also, I'm calling it, these are applied, there are applied classes, which are classes that really connected spirituality with the music, arts, and literature. So we're going to dive into a little bit of this. And one of the things you should know is that whatever class you took, they were really intensely, um, they were difficult. One of the, uh, the Buddhist monk who came in said, Swamiji, I thought I knew English, but when I come here and when they're talking in class, I don't understand anything of what they're saying. It takes a little time to get oriented to the language and the vocabulary of the academia. And um, so, and they also, they would assign you basically 100 to 150 pages of reading per week, per class. And some of this reading is academic reading. So you'd have to read through it twice or three times. When you came to class, they wouldn't summarize the reading for you. They'd expect you to know it, and then they'd ask your opinions about things. So you really had to come prepared. Next. The first set of classes I can, I'm going to describe are the scripture classes. Here you see Dr. Francis Clooney. He's a Jesuit monk. He's a Catholic priest. And he's the one that actually founded this Hindu monastic uh, program for us. He's also a scholar in South Asian studies. He's what we called a closed reading specialist. He can take a scripture, which I took with him, the Brihadaranaka Upanishad, and he can uncompact it. He could take a verse and he can really take two or three days to dive deep into that verse. He's, he's an amazing knowledge of Sanskrit and South Asian history and sociology. So he sees it from many angles. What you can discover is that academic classes are different from the way we learn here, which I'm going to call more practical type of, I'm sorry, practitioner style classes. What does it mean to learn in an academic arena versus coming to a place like this or a temple or a church and learn from a practitioner style? Well, in the academia, next, in the academia style, you're going to learn that the most important thing to develop is critical analysis. You develop a critical way of thinking. You learn to question the authority, the legitimacy, and the source, and you analyze the content. You don't assume anything. When I went to India, I was two years in the seminary where all the monks were there. And at that time, when I was there, I used to ask a lot of questions. And I get scolded all the time. They tell me, don't just sit with the information. Meditate on it. And then reflect on it. And then if questions come up, then ask. But here in these classes, the professors encouraged you to ask questions. That was the way knowledge got revealed. So in the academia, another way is that you, look, you, you can even look at your own tradition in a critical lens. You, ask yourself, you can ask yourself the tough questions, maybe about the way that historically, how is your, tra how's your tradition treated others? How does it look from a gender point of view? You have to remain respectful, but it allows you another way of looking at your tradition. And you're learning from different intellectual perspectives, from you're interpreting text through language, history, sociology, and, um, and race. The key here in academic learning is you have to remain objective, unbiased. So the result is the learning is what? It's conceptual. You don't enter into the tradition. So you're always at a distance. Now, if you compare that to a practitioner style of learning, what you're going to find is that you begin by learning from within a tradition. Whatever your tradition you may be, you begin with the tradition. And you'll find in a practitioner, you come in with what? With a certain amount of faith. That's an indispensable part of being a practitioner. Um, there's a term called shraddha. Have you guys heard that term, shraddha? It means a dynamic, intuitive conviction that I have in the scriptures. 
I may not understand it, but it's my shraddha, it's my faith in these scriptures that allows me to keep moving on. It gives me strength and support. So although things do not make sense at the time, if I work through it, things will be revealed. You, here you're trying to embody the teachings, to make it a lifestyle, so that the way you interact with others, the way you see nature around you, the way you see yourself starts to change. You start to feel more centered, connected with others, and you feel a sense of expansion. And in the practitioner style, also spiritual experiences are to be explored. In academia, we don't explore spiritual experiences. So it includes experiences, rituals you do, disciplining yourself, making lifestyle changes so the scriptures become a reality. Next. And what I discovered in these academic courses, some of my blind spots started becoming revealed. What were some of those blind spots? I'm gonna give you an example. I took advanced, um, advanced introduction to Buddhism. In that class, we were studying the life of Buddha. And it was a source called the Buddha Charita, which is by Ashva Gosha. It's considered the most authentic source, authentic biography on Buddha. In that discussion, the professor was talking about Buddha, talking to young male disciples, and talking about how um, some of the women could be seen as objects of desires, so they are to be shunned away from for those young novice monks. There was a woman in our class. She was also a Buddhist. Uh, she was Buddhist. She talked about how uncomfortable she started feeling in the language of that scripture. And in my Vedantic training, after class, I pulled her aside and thought in my monastic, okay, well, this is what I've learned about the scriptures, that Buddha is talking to male monks. If he was talking to female, females, it would be different. The language would be different. And then she would go back to me, well, where are the voices of the women? I said, I feel uneasy about this language here. Why? Because I don't feel then nirvana is accessible to me. I feel it's a male talking to other males. And I feel uneasy about how women are being described. So there's a sense of identity that I, know I don't feel connected to here. She was right. I remember afterwards thinking about this and I called some of the nuns in our convent in Hollywood and asked them, you know, we have a scripture called the Gospel of Ramakrishna and it refers sometimes to women in gold as being obstacles. And I was like, do you feel the same way? They said, of course. I'm like, wow. <laughs> there is a need for more voices of women to be expressed. For what purpose? To be able to connect with the source, connect that with a sense that I also uh, uh, can achieve liberation. I also, if I practice these paths, I asked an, a professor, can you give me some other examples? She described a per, she said language is important because it does create a sense of identity. She gave an example of Mirabai, a young woman devotee of Lord Krishna. And she talked about the example of her prayer when she spoke in India, when it begins to rain, you wear these scarves to protect your hair. She wore a red scarf. And as it rained, the, the, uh, the dye from the scarf started to bleed down and pour into her body until her whole body was painted with red color. And in her prayer to Krishna, she's telling Krishna, this is how I feel for you. The red is like love. Every cell of my body is tingling with the love that I feel for you. This is such a vivid imagery but it's only an experience that women in India would know and understand. It's again, it's a way of identifying. So going back to this, then I thought, well, how can we reconcile this? The scriptures are set up in a way. You have Shankaracharya talking to young people and, uh, and, and this is the way it's expressed. You can't change the scriptures. So how are we gonna reconcile this? I pose this to my professor. So, he said, this is something that we need to explore. He gave an answer, we could talk about it later, but so it's one of the things that blind spots. Another blind spot very quickly was 
Um, in the class, in my another class, I remember we were talking about issues that came up about, say, the feeling of like why there's not peace in the world. And from a Vedantic perspective, we're always taught if you want to find peace outside, you've got to pr do practices inside. And if you feel peace inside, that will be reflected outside. Half the class doesn't buy that. Half the class was like, if you see racial injustice, discrimination, uh, gender bias, whatever form of discrimination, doesn't it make you feel mad? As a, as a practitioner, don't you want to do something about it? We've got to work at a larger level, at an institutional level. This is a systemic problem. There was a tension between those that were thinking about from the individual point of view and those that were thinking about the larger institutional point of view. And what I started to see is that from my point of view, the way I was seeing, maybe it was a bottom-up approach, working at a grassroots where the individuals change and eventually society changes. And others were looking at it from a top-down approach. The institution needs to change and that can trickle down to the individual just different ways of approaching this. Next. So some of the uh, classes that I really enjoyed were uh, a class called Spiritual Counseling taught by Dr. Ger Cheryl Giles, who you see is the woman over there. What I loved about this class was that um, it was an experiential interactive class and the students actually co-created the class. We brought in our own difficulties and problems and shared that and the professors, first of all, especially in these classes, were very open about themselves. They'd bring into situations, she's a chaplain and a, and a counselor and a, and a psychologist. She'd talk about the difficulties, the problems she had when she was in chaplaincy and, uh, and about the case scenarios of the difficult patients she had to work with and the problems she endured and the solutions she gave. She, they even talk about their own inner junk, you could say, inner essence. They talked about how they went to see therapist. And the reason for seeing therapist is to bring the shadow side of yourself. You want to, become, you want to know your deficiencies, your irritations, and your triggers. You want to bring that up so that you don't project it onto your client. It was important to know the underconscious self. They talked about this very freely. Um, in these classes, we'd have, we'd get into like groups of three where you'd have a counselor, a counselee, and an observer. Mm -hmm. And then you'd start to work on how to counsel people. One of the biggest problems in our counseling sessions that came up with most people was the fix-it mentality. We'd immediately hear something, jump to a conclusion, and then want to fix it. And the idea here they talked about counseling was how to create a detached, loving presence so people can unfold, talk, discuss, open up, share what's inside. And you'll start to see, not only do they have the problems, but they also have the solutions as well. It's just about being a guide to help identify them. Um, there was a professor in our class, Dr. Uh, Chris Berlin, you'll see in the next slide. He talked about a case, he's a chaplain, uh, and talked about a case where he was in the hospital and he went into a room and immediately he was met with hostility. The woman asked him, what's your religion? And she was a fundamental Christian. And he said, I'm a Buddhist. She said, oh, you're going to hell. He immediately felt defensive, said, I'm going to walk out and go to the next patient. He stopped. He thought, this issue is not about me. It's about how can I help support her needs and support her journey in spirituality. So he came back and connected with her. Next. Um, another class we had was this compassion, death, and dying. And in this type of class, we'd actually have these small circles. We'd start off with a meditation on death. The idea about this class is you have to know to be able to deal with your own death before you can help others. So what we did was in the beginning of class, uh, one of the, we started off by writing an obituary. You wrote about what your experience of death would be like. Where would it be? Who would be there? And um, what I thought was interesting was that in the obituaries, every one of the students did not write about where they went to school, what their titles were, what their jobs were, what did they write about? 
They wrote about the love they received in life, the love they gave to others, and about the connection with their own sangha. Next. Another thing that we had an opportunity to do was we had an opportunity to create these Dharma boxes. Do you guys know what a Dharma box is? It's, it's a box that you put things in, and when you're going to pass away, these are things you want to bring out. They may have instructions on what chants or prayers you want done. Um, they may fill the objects of what you want to be reminded about at the time of transitioning. So, for example, for myself, I had photographs of Sri Ramakrishna Mother, my parents, my guru. I wanted incense to be burned, chanting from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, at the time of passing away, before passing away, you want Ganges water to drink, to purify. So just a variety of things. Um, there are people that had letters, poems, cards. One woman wrote letters, uh, cards that she wanted her children to read just before she passed away. It was a way basically of completing our emotional closure with the relationships that we were most meaningful to us. Next. Probably the most fun I had, this is the class that I really loved, was called Religious Dimensions of Human Experience. This is taught by Prof. David Carrasco. He's a combination, what I'd say, between, if you know, I think it's James Almos, who's an actor, and Denzel Washington. He was just a cool cat. In this class, we, um, we talked about here, let's see, we started off with personal encounters with the holy. And we, talk, and we go through a variety of different experiences from Black Elk doing his ghost dance and the mystical experience he had, to Rabindranath Tagore in nature, having a mystical nature experience, to the, um, the nun, um, Saint Avila, Teresa of Avila, having a rapturous experience. And in all of these experiences, there's a common theme. The theme was how small they felt in the vastness and glory of the divine. We'd, um, we had Judith Sherman, who was a Holocaust, Holocaust survivor, come to class. And she sp not only spoke about the atrocities of the Holocaust, but she talked about when she met after death, when she meets God, she wants to hold a mirror to God's face and say to him, how can you look at yourself knowing what was going on? How can you live with yourself knowing that this was happening? It brought up the question, is the divine not only the source of the good, but is it also the source of the bad? What so-called bad? We had... Tony Amaker, um, our Harvard basketball coach, come in. And he would talk about um, how blessings can be disguised as pain, setbacks, and failures. He mentioned a player of his, Jeremy Lin, who's a Japanese-American, who was a great player for Harvard University. But then when he went on to the NBA, he couldn't get drafted. And for months, a long period of time, he was living with his brother on his couch. What happened was he kept practicing and practicing and practicing. And then he eventually had an opportunity to come back to the NBA. And if you know anything about basketball, he, there was a period where he flourished. He became a rock star in the NBA. And Professor, uh, and so Tony Amaker, the coach, said, destiny is where opportunity meets self-effort. Destiny is where opportunity meets self-effort. Um, we even had the School of Berkeley in Boston come in and perform, uh, perform uh, jazz, uh, talk about the spirituality behind music, and looking at saying that the divine was, music is the divine impulse turning into divine vibration. And that divine vibration is manifesting in the sound that we hear. He would take the sound of the wind that we normally hear and play it on the piano. How the river crashes with the, with the rocks and play that on the piano. He took, a, took somebody's name, Tony, Tony, 
da da da. He started taking everything that we experience into sound. And there was a mysticism about this sound. And made a whole song out of these two notes, da 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 da. It was really just another way of experiencing reality. Next. And next. So, some things outside of the classrooms we had a chance to do was every Thursday at the interreligious chapel in Harvard, there would be a different group who would do a service and then explain that service. So, for the right, for example, there was the Hindu group who performed Diwali. Next. There was also, I had a chance to go uh, outside the campus and attend some of these different musical events. So here what you see is a group called Silk Road. Um, they are a different bunch of performers from, the, from this Asian culture who get together and they all perform and even outside the Asian culture. And so you'll find different people like, you'll find the sitar, violins, the cello, you'll find the congo, um, just very, guitars, violins, various instruments all coming together as an ensemble and playing harmoniously. There's, this, there's an African-American woman who began by singing jazz songs. Then she, then she sang Rabindranath Tagore's song of the National Anthem of India in Bengali. And then she sang in Japanese. It's an amazing experience. And what I remember was behind me, at the end, I remember there's someone who was getting up and sort of bumped into me because he was sitting right behind me. And I was like, oh, excuse me, it's, it's not over yet. And then he went up onto stage. Next. And this is the person. It was Yo-Yo Ma. So he got up on the stage. You can see I was right, I was on the front row there. He got up on the stage and started playing. It was, it was, and then I found out he's the founder of Silk Road. It was really something special. Um, next. I had a chance also, some of you may have done this, go to a Van Gogh exhibit where they blow up pieces of art, Van Gogh's pieces of art, into these big structures by projecting them on the wall. And that was, you really enter into the art. Someone's telling me that, you know, when Van Gogh's looking at that, he's looking at nature, experiencing it through his emotions, and then depicting it on the canvas. So what we're seeing is his experience of reality. If it was just an exact duplicate of nature, it'd just be a photograph. But this is his depiction of starry nights. And, the, and so what it does, when you see something like that, it makes you stop. You say, I've seen this picture. I've seen, this is nature. We all see nature. But how many of us stop and see it through this lens? There's a very mystical element in that. Next. Harvard, it's, it's in Cambridge, New England area. It is also cold. So you, my first experience um, at th that year with snow, and you can see what happens. The first time it snowed, it was silent. I went outside, nobody was there, no cars, except for that one vehicle there. But there's a heaviness to that silence you start to experience. Next. Um, at the end of our journey, we had a chance to go with our professor, um, Dr. Clooney, who took us to Walden Pond. And this is the place where Henry Thoreau um, had done spiritual practices for two years. He lived in solitude here. And we just walked around, sort of reflecting about, around the pond, reflecting on our experiences. Next. And to close off here, we had, a, had an opportunity to go on a chaplaincy retreat um, at this Buddhist retreat center. This is about one and a half hours outside of Boston. The beauty of this was it was done by two of our professors, Dr. Gerald Shiles, who you saw, and Dr. Chris Berlin. They created such an atmosphere that you started to open up. There were 45 people in this retreat. Half were chaplains, half were uh, students who were becoming chaplains from Harvard and Yale. We would be silent outside of class, but in class, what started happening was that you started, started just uh, softening up. Everybody was just so accepting and wonderful. Everybody started opening and sharing from their inner, inner experiences, everything that they were feeling. And in this sharing experience, what you start to notice is that the heaviness that you felt in the heart, the things that you've been carrying, all of that started to empty out. 
I mean, I had an experience in the second the last day where in a trigger, something, an incident that triggered something, where in the class, all of a sudden, tears started to flood out. And it was just like five minutes of crying. I remember that, I don't think I've ever cried like that for maybe 20 years. I don't remember the last time tears existed. So, and in that sense of emptying out, what started happening? All the intellectual knowledge, the spiritual teachings that we get, started to come in, seep its way into the heart. And the heart started accepting, opening up the teachings, and you started to embody them. That's the beauty of having something of a silent retreat. And I love their style and approach to creating an accepting atmosphere. Um, next. And I wanted to show, this is, this is the bicycle that took me everywhere. This is, I was given this bicycle on the second day I came to Harvard. I stayed at, a, um, at, at, at an Airbnb because my room wasn't ready. And the couple there, there's a, a Jamaican couple, were so nice. They let, gave, gave me this bicycle free. And I used this bicycle during the rain, during the snow, and everything. Then, when it was time to go, what happened? I was trying to find a person to give it to. I couldn't find, I called a friend who said maybe he can find someone. So, I, that night I left it uh, at the, near the physics building, and then, the next day I left. When I got back to San Diego, I got a call. It said the bike had been stolen. <laughs> so whoever giveth was the same person who receiveth. The divine gives freely and the divine takes away freely. We just have the right to the use of it, but we don't have the right to claim it. And last one, next. So now I've talked about what I was looking in the rear view mirror, what we're, what we're taking into Harvard in the, uh, with our past. What was the blind spots that were coming up for me? Now, looking into the future, what does, what does this all hold? And for me, all of this, I had basically took a lot of classes for focusing on chaplaincy and counseling and so for me, it was opening up a new field about Hindu, ch Hindu chaplaincy, a Vedantic chaplain. Um, chaplains are ones who have to understand the scriptures and apply them into today's situation. They're also people who should know rituals and how to adapt those rituals to people who may have immediate problems like transitioning to death or how to, how to use rituals to make others feel more uh, cleansed or connected. And also, they should have a degree of being able to counsel, being able to mentor, being able to help people in grief, depression, in crisis, know the resources. So for me, that was something that I found very a new role that was opening up for me. And what's happened is this role has helped me get into, it's called a CPE program, a Chaplaincy Practitional Experience Program. It's a chaplain intern. So it's opened up where I'm going to UC San Diego starting next month with five other um, ministers from different traditions. And we will be interning at UC San Diego as chaplains in their hospital. We'll be guided by an interreligious minister will help us as we deal with different crises, different patients, and how to deal, learning different rituals from different traditions, and really trying to basically help others in a more extended way. This goes back to the heart of the Ram Krishna motto of our organization, Atmana Mokshartam Jagat Hitaya Cha, for one's own welfare and for the welfare of the world. These two have to be interacted, coordinated together and so this will help me to be able to help others in a much more extended way. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swami Prindamananda. Now it's time for questions or any comments. Oh, so we, do, we have Q&A yes, session here? Q &A here. Oh, I yeah. see. All right. 
just want to say what an incredible, wonderful opportunity you had, and to see how it's manifesting. It's a beautiful story. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, if anyone has uh, any questions, please wait for the microphone to arrive so everyone can hear your question. Tommy, did you also get to participate representing Vedanta or Ramakrishna Order giving talks or as opposed to only being a student? Uh, yes. So there were um, two things. One was that, first of all, there's a formal talks at Harvard. So we were interviewed as a Vedantic monk in the, in the Harvard newspaper. We had to give an interview about our journey. And then also, we had to, um, we had to speak in front, of, in front of the dean and in front of the academia. There was an organized talk at Harvard where we spoke about our monastic tradition, where, how we grew up, how it's influenced our lives, and what it means to us. So yes, that, and then what I, most importantly, what I felt was that not only did I learn at Harvard, but it also offered me a chance to contribute. So in classes, for example, when we were talking, I took a Christian mysticism class. And in these classes, the great thing about it is the discussion. Half the class, some of these classes, may be a little bit of um, uh, the professor will talk and opens it up to discussion. So we talk about things like, say, St. Teresa of Avila, the seven mansions. They talk about the experience of the seven mansions. And then you start to say, wow, you correlate that. That sounds a lot like the seven chakras of the tantric system. In Buddhism, we correlate a lot with nirvana and with the Advaitic experiences. Um, there were chances of what I found was, especially outside of class, talking with, say, the Sufi mystics uh, who are students in our class, and about the mystical experiences of Hafiz and Rumi, and how that aligned so much with the Advaitic tradition, the mystical experience of the Hindu monks. So there's a lot of going back and forth, and there's a lot of, I felt, contributing also. Not only did we learn, but it was a chance for others to understand the Vedantic position. So did you wear Gerala when you were on campus? So, uh, so sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. One of the nice things about our professor, Clooney, he wanted us to experiment. He said, you know, you, this is a chance to explore a new meaning of monastic identity for you. See what, how do feel people feel when you're without Gera? How do people feel when you're with Gera? Sometimes do people close up when you're in this way? Do they start to act in different manners? Say like in, in, these, in the small group settings, compared to if you don't wear it, do they open up more? Are they more, do, are they more friendly? So there's all, everybody's remember, we're all coming with different baggage. We're all coming from different lenses. So it was just interesting to experiment, and he allowed us to do that. Wow. I, um, I was just curious, did, hmm. were there any representations of like a Catholic um, um, mysticism? Because I know there's different sects of the Catholics, um, and there's, there's some sects that do believe in like the reincarnation and things like that. So I'm just curious, were there any from the Catholic? I, I, I you mean the, people, uh, stu here. students from the Catholic tradition? Yes. Or monastics? At the, at the, at the Harvard. Yeah, there, there, yes. There was? There, there's, there are many. Okay. Um, uh, Francis yeah. Clooney was, he, I went to a Bible study class with him. Uh -huh. uh, and so he's, he's from the Catholic tradition. And so a, there was about 25, 30, 25 to 30 people that were at is from the Harvard Divinity School who were Catholic. If I could get your contact, because I'm, I'm meeting with the Catholic ones who are... Um, probably this week and to speak about something. Um, I'll, if, I'll speak with you if I can get your number later. Thank sure, you. sure. Um, I, my question was with the chaplain that spoke with the patient that was a mentalist. Yes. Did he tell you how he changed, like, was able to bridge that hostility and the aggression that she felt towards him? I think, um, I, I mean, he didn't go into details, I remember, but I think the point he was making was that first he, he first his whole self-defense mechanism came on and he was starting to walk away. And so then that light rung in his head. This is not about you. This is not your issue. So how do you connect? How do you connect? And so he said, I want to help. I want to support your journey on the path of Christ. How can, we, how can I help connect with you? Would you like me to read the Bible? 
What are some of the activities I can do to help support you on your journey? That was the idea. So if it was, if he can get him, if he can help get her some resources, um, some prayers, can just chant along with her, that's, he was willing to do that. Hi, right, so yeah. earlier you were talking about how language is really important. And just building off of this example, um, here you had a difference where um, the Buddhist chaplain initially felt defensive. Uh, one could call that uh, discrimination that he experienced because he's of a different faith following a different tradition. Uh, in the context of social science, especially here in America, when we hear of discrimination, we kind of think of it as a bad thing because it's separating some people from other people in terms of things, structures are unequal. And then in the context of Spirituality, especially with Vedanta, we think of discrimination as Viveka, separating between what is good and bad, what's unreal, and what's real. So my question is, given that in Vedanta, especially in the Vedanta, we think of what is real as being oneness, unity, and then here you are in a place that's very diverse with people from all different backgrounds, different uh, spiritual traditions and beliefs, some may be either individually or coming from like an institution, more inclusive, whereas others may be more exclusive. Yes. Um, how did you find that experience? How did you resolve that? Did you see that people were able to find common ground? And I guess, how is that kind of shaping your perspective for the future? So <clears throat> from what I heard, Harvard Divinity School is a different program compared to other academic schools you would go to, right? there's really an idea of this all-inclusiveness. So people are coming in with the idea of learning from each other. So no matter what your background is, you're, you're very respectful in classes. I noticed that. Everybody's very respectful, and they want to hear what you have to say. So I found that, and if they didn't understand, they'd want to clarify that. They'd question you to get clarity on these points. So I didn't feel much of any kind of like, um, my way is the only right way. I didn't feel that in that program itself. Mm -hmm. I felt there was just, um, it was, we were playing off each other. We were, it was giving, enriching our, each other, we were enriching our own tradition by seeing it in different, from different perspectives. That's how I felt. So there's this really, I mean, I remember when I was, <clears throat> this, the, the, that comparative Christianity class I was taking about, there's this one person who was talking about universal truths and about, um, about the oneness. And I was like, boy, he speaks to me in a Vedantic language. Where is, he, where is he coming from? I pulled him aside. He's talking from the Sufi, tr Sufi tradition. And we talked. We got a chance to talk and explore these matters. Um, so I felt just, I felt really, it was, it was a unique atmosphere of, of supporting and learning from each other. One more question. Yes, Swami, uh, you mentioned something about having to deal with uh, this feeling of superiority or inferiority when you enter, and especially after having gone through Vedanta. Uh, and then, I, I think it's similar to his question, like, and then mixing with these other faiths, how did you reconcile this superiority or inferiority that you might have had entering? Uh, by, by, by learning that, um, just, I was humbled. In the second week, I was humbled by, by the variety of different knowledge that existed around me. I mean, remember, everybody, this is, uh, it's a really a, uh, it's an intense program. And the students there are highly intellectual. So whatever they say, they rationalize, they can, they can back everything up. So I was just humbled by the different ways and perspectives that I did not know anything about. So um, for me, it was just, uh, it was just, I, I loved it. It's just, there may have been a feeling like, oh, we're from Vedanta, we would believe all religions are right. Where the, sort of like, there may have been an attitude of superiority, but then you start to see other traditions and they're talking in the same language. I'm like, really? You guys also talk about this? The experience of oneness from the saints to, it was just like, it was, I was a humbling process and it was giving me a new vocabulary to build upon with new imagery, new ideas, 
from black elk having this mystical experience in this ghost dance. It was just, it was just, it was an incredible experience. Well, I forgot what I loved most about Harvard was meeting with the professors. The professors were accessible. They wanted to know about me. So what happens is after class, I spent a lot of my time going to coffee houses with the professors. And really, it was, at, it was outside of class where you get to know the person and the, how much they want to know about you. And that's where we connected. So for me, Harvard was really more about connection on a heart-to-heart -heart level. That's what I felt. So my question is pretty much along the lines of the last two questions. But um, when you say about the blind spots, um, when you identify them, can you talk about your journey? Because I would think maybe it's maybe I'm thinking. Do you does one go through confusion, deeper dive, some acceptance and clarity? Yeah, that's that's good. Yes, exactly. Those are the good. Those are good stages to talk about. Um, yes. <clears throat> First of all, how do I know it's a blind spot? Well, I was noticing about myself. I was getting irritated by what the person was saying. There's a little bit of agitation coming. And, um, and then I found myself also, you know, there's a, this is the time of the Divine Mother. This is actually the first day of Durga Puja coming on. Like a few years ago, I gave a talk on the Chandi. And there's a demon called Mahishasura in that, uh, in that book. And it's a, it's a, he represents the Rajasic defensive ego. He wants power, he wants to be seen, he wants to be known. It's all about name, fame, and power. So his reaction is that of anger, hostility, rage, and it goes from, you know, from just feeling irritated to this whole emotional range. So my blind spots when I was feeling a little bit of irritated, agitation, why aren't they hearing me? Why can't they see what I'm saying is right? When I was feeling all these things, that was an indication of my blind spot. And then with the blind spot, what's important, how to work through that. And then what I had to do was like turn off, try to, to okay, let me shut down what I'm thinking and try to give all my attention to what they're saying. What is the point this person is trying to make? What are their needs that they're trying to express? And am I seeing it just from, I'm seeing it from different ways. So that's, that's how I was reconciling these blind spots, was just I had to move my own ego aside, be open to that person, be present, and then try to understand what is it you want, what is it you need, what is it you're trying to express. And in doing so, I was starting to get the message of what was trying to be conveyed. And that opened me up. Anybody else? One here. I look forward to your lectures all the time. They are the best in the world. And my question is, before you went to Harvard and after Harvard, you continued the same monastic path that you chose before and afterwards. Did Harvard change you in some ways to continue where you're going? Or did you struggle or you still knew what exactly you wanted. I think it's helped expand me. It's, it's, uh, through the training, I was learning classes. It's been expanding my way of thinking, my way of doing. That's why I'm in this chaplaincy program itself to offer alternative n new approaches of service. So I think that's what it's really helped expand my sense of, and it's given me an appreciation also for what Vedanta is.